we have Cryptoriana, The Seductiveness of Decay, the newest album from Cradle of Filth which is very much a callback to some of their older stuff, like Midian and um, Cruelty Brought the Orchids, oh, whatever album that's from. <laughs> so they went quite a way ago. Yeah. They've had like 17,000 albums, so... <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, it's very much a callback to older stuff. Uh, Cruelty and the Beast, that's the name of the album. Um, I really like this album. I I'd say it's a great addition to the catalogue. Uh it feels like a fusion of styles and sounds calling back on various albums, not just their older ones, but also things like Godspeed on Devil's Thunder and um, Hammer of Witches, those sorts of albums, or blending the styles that they've had. Uh, it's interesting to consider that compared to a lot of their previous albums, there are a lot of solos going on in this. Yeah, I've noticed there's a lot of solo work going on. Actually, I don't really recall that from the albums I've heard. I mean, I've only heard four of their albums. I think it was all around the same kind of era, around the million era, as you mentioned. But I don't remember there being that much solo work. Yeah, solos haven't really been their focal area. It's more been... They've more been about layers and developments in combinations of sounds. Hmm. Uh, they've more been focused on everyone getting a spot as opposed to one particular or two particular people getting a spot. Mm. Uh, standout tracks for me are things like West of Vespertine, um, which, you know how when we did the uh, Winter Sun review and I was saying about how Autumn's drumming was too rapid and pervasive? West of Vespertine is an example of how you do the rapid and constant drumming correctly because it doesn't overpower things and it just it acts as a driving force. Yeah, there's, there's things, there's kind of whatever qualifier, there's kind of pseudo black metal, I guess. Black metal core? I don't fucking know what they are. They're, they're classified as extreme metal. They do have a lot of that kind of blast beat drumming, which kind of draws a lot of that stuff from what I've heard, at least. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to note, and something that I do actually have to commend for them doing so, is that there are no instrumentals on this album. Now, I have no problem with their instrumentals. Their instrumentals are amazing. But for me, it did start to feel like a bit of a crutch for them. Was kind of there to be the token instrumental piece? Yeah. So the complete removal of any instrumentals feels like a good way for them to progress because it shows that they're not reliant upon the instrumentals. Things are, even though they haven't got any proper instrumental tracks, they do seem to have uh, they seem to have got more focus towards the instrumental parts to the songs they do have, which is a good way of balancing it out, I think. Yeah. And more instrumental interlude as part of songs rather than having it as a separate entity. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking through. Um, I mean, listening to it at the moment and just sort of aligning it with when I saw them live the other day and it's all, there were a few tracks from the album that they played obviously, because it is the Cryptoriana tour, so it would make sense. Tour, yeah, it'd be a new album, so... Um, uh, one sec. I actually have the playlist from the show, so I can check which songs they played live. Um, I know it was Achingly Beautiful, which, again, is another standout for me, and... I think especially the, um... Uh, I think the You Will Need a Line Bay's Claw and Not at the Catapult Manor are the two that stand out to me most. Uh, which one? Uh, you Will Need a Line Bay's Claw and Not at Catapult Manor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Um, yeah, You Will Know the Line by His Claw, which seems to be a fan favourite, so. Also, seems to put out an official video for that as well, which is interesting. So he's definitely pushing that one. Mm hmm. Yeah. Achingly Beautiful was. Yeah. It was Achingly Beautiful and You Will Know the Lion by His Claw that were the ones they played. Uh, interestingly enough, on the set list, they don't list one of the songs that they did play, which was, of course, Cradle to Enslave. Which... I don't know whether they just you know, have it on there. They don't need to write it down because they know it's going to be there. <laughs> yeah, it, it's sort of like, well, that was the closer. And it's sort of like, you know it's going to be the closer, because it's their most famous track. Um, yeah, the sounds on this are 
very reminiscent of things like um, Cruelty Brought the Orchids and Cruelty and the Beast, um, Midian, all those sorts of things, uh, but also entreating upon them sort of... It's not just guitar solos, that's the thing. There's also vocal solos and um, it, you've got organ work solos, as it were. Do vocal solos kind of make sense because it is... Daddy feels baby after all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, because of the amount of lineup changes they've had, although it's more of a revolving door as opposed to what a lot of bands with lineup changes have, which is they never associate with each other ever again, um, it is essentially Danny Filth and the Filthettes at this point. <laughs> Danny Filth and the Dirty Bunch. <laughs> Because it's like, um, okay, so for the last three years, you've had Lindsay Schoolcraft, um, who is an amazing singer and an amazing keyboard player. Um, yeah, the lineup at the moment is Richard Shaw and Ashok on guitars, Daniel James Firth on bass, Martin Skarupa. Skarupka on drums and Lindsay Schoolcraft on keyboards and backing vocals slash female vocals. Well, the reason to have gone through quite a few changes. So, they've been around for a long time though, so it's not entirely surprising. I think some bands have never changed, even after like two decades or longer. Yeah, well, consider Metallica. Okay, they they had a lot of lineup changes when they first started out, but from like the late eighties to uh, two thousand two thousand one, something like that, they had the same bassist, and the only member to have changed since they really formed as it was James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, and Kirk Hammett have always been there, and the bassist has all has been one that stuck around for a good sort of like 10... Well, let's see. Robert Trujillo's been with them for the past 14 years at least, so... Um, uh, yeah. Ah! Okay, so the members who've been with them... Okay, so the last the last album and this album, you had Ashok... So Ashok is the most metal-sounding name. <laughs> His full name is Marek... Ashok Smeerda. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty metal name. Um, Martin Skorupka has been on all the albums since Godspeed on Devil's Thunder. Um, he was actually doing keyboards on Manticore and other horrors. Uh, so, yeah, whilst the lineup changes have differed over the course of their career, I suppose calling it Danny Filth and the Filthettes is a bit unkind because it's not like they haven't been able to keep together. I mean, God, Paul Alenda, he, he left for a couple of albums, then came back for one, two, three, four, five, six, for seven albums. Many, many albums. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, it's probably because of the various lineup change ups that was. You can still recognise it as Cradle of Filth. It doesn't sound repetitive. It doesn't sound like they've recycled things. You've got callbacks to sounds, but there's always something new. That's it. From what I remember, it does sound very much recognisable as a start, but it doesn't sound, well, cliche, I guess. Yeah, and... Given what we were saying about Marilyn Manson, it really is one of those, yes, we need this sort of stuff to be out there. Unfortunately, Marilyn Manson is the one to uh, likely get more focus because Cradle of Filth are, whilst they're a well-known band, they're still technically underground. It's weird. Metal's weird like that, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this album and... Um, I think one thing we do need to talk about a little bit, actually, is um, Alice in Hell. Yeah. Being a cover of Annihilator. It's, uh, it's certainly got their own spin on it. It's not the first song they covers, I'm pretty sure of that. Mm. I think it's a pretty good cover, actually. Oh, they've done a lot of, they've done a lot of covers. Um, the weirdest cover they've done is um, Devil Woman by, uh, by Cliff Richard. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine them doing it, actually. <laughs> That's one of those... What? But seeing Annihilator are a pretty well-known band in themselves, and 
Asin Hill is probably the most well-known song they've had. Mm. You can't say I'm surprised that they decided to cover it. But... Well, is, well, isn't Alison Hill the name of the album as well as the song? It is, yes. Um, Having heard the uh, original quite a few times, it is a pretty solid cover, actually. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm in two minds about it. On the one hand, I like it as a song in its own right, but for me it jars a bit on the album in in and of itself. I mean, it is... I suppose it is... That's what's fun on track, I guess. It's like an extra add-on at the end. Well, it is actually the special edition album that has Alice in Hell. It's very common to have bonus covers as special edition stuff. It happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, The Night at Catafalque Manor and Alice in Hell are both the digipack, digital and vinyl version. Wait, Catafalque is not on the main album? Yeah. That's, that's upsetting, because it's probably one of the best songs all. Not my personal favourite, but... Um, the important thing to note is that even though it's eight track, only eight tracks long, it's not a short album. It's like well, most of the songs are like seven minutes long, aren't they? So, but almost all of them are. There's only one. There are only two songs, not counting the bonus material, that are less than seven minutes long. What which is like six? Yeah, six. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, three that aren't seven minutes long because the opening track is only two minutes 15 but that's that's fairly typical for cradle to have the opening track as being a very short one so but yeah i mean my personal favorite is you will know the line by his claw well it's between that and west west of vespertine but both west of vespertine is a good song yeah yeah and those are two of the longer tracks on the album so our tried and true example of us favouring the longest, well, uh, one or both of us, in fact, yeah, both of us favouring the longer songs, whether it's bonus material or not, it's tried and true, because the only songs song longer than the ones we we favour are Death and the Maiden, which is a brilliant closer. In fact, that's kind of why I'm in two minds about the bonus tracks, because I feel Death and the Maiden should be the last track. Well, same as when we um, review Draconian and the Marriage of Taurus being a super good ending. Yeah. And then we have the bonus track after that, which kind of flew off the flow of it. Mm. So it happens quite often, it seems. So the kind of bonus track is added on the end as bonuses. And it... Yeah. The problem is they're usually added on well, as bonuses on top of an album which has already got a perfectly crafted ending. The album's designed with that kind of ending and then take something on after it. And... Oh, that can't be lost both. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, there wouldn't be any out any songs that I would cut because all these songs have a place but I would rearrange things and essentially I'd say with The Night at Catafalque Manor and Alice in Hell you know how albums with bonus material will have the bonus songs slotted in between the other songs that's how I how I would have ran it that it would be rearranged that way so Night at Catafalque Manor possibly after Heartbreak and Seance. That could work, yeah. Because as a progression after Death and the Maiden, it feels a bit jarring. Um, but here's the thing, and this is why I've given it the score that I have. Um, the problems I have are nitpicks that don't spoil the album in its own right. Naturally, there's always going to be stuff that you prefer and all that sort of thing. But as I say, it's nitpicks. And considering it's nitpicks of bonus material, it doesn't feel fair to let that affect the score too much. As it stands, I'd give it a 4.5 out of 5. Uh, what's the score? What's the score? What's the score? I'd probably still be inclined to stick with something about a 3.5, so because it's not entirely the kind of thing I go towards metal-wise. So it's not my personal favourite type of genre. Mm. To be, f- but it's a pretty good, good job of it. So. To be fair, I am a bit biased because Cradle of Filth is like that's my introductory band to the heavier side of metal. Mm. I came in via Demi Borgia of all things, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cradle of Filth were the bands that I majorly gravitated towards and it's one of those things of because they were like my first really heavy band I, I know compared to 
a lot of bands, they're not that heavy. But, you know, compare that to things like Metallica or Motorhead or um, Alice in Chains or anything like that. It's considerably heavier. Yeah. Well, it's, it's this thing you always have the kind of soft spot for the one you came in on as well. Yeah. Um, I think all, a lot of it is also to do with um, the experience of hearing them do new things and try out new ways of doing their music. That really ramps it up for me. Um, I think that's really all I have to say, aside from definitely check it out. Uh, I would say if you kind of issued cradle of filth when thornography came out and haven't listened to them since this is a great jumping back on point i know a lot of people didn't care for thornography um it's actually quite funny because um they played under huntress moon which is one of the last tracks on thornography and um he said i know this isn't everyone's cup of tea but it's our album so fuck off words to that effect um i think that's also what i like about cradle is that whilst their music might not necessarily be liked by everyone else they do like their music and it's not like they'll they'll go oh we're never going to play anything from that ever again although to this day, I still want to hear them play their cover of Temptation live. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's one of the things they seem to be quite known for, is that cover, actually. It seems to be a very popular cover. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's because it started out as a joke, so... Yeah. Um, but anyway, if you found yourself going not sure about Cradle these days, then this would be a good one to hear how they've evolved and improved. Of course, this is coming from a very biased standpoint. I can't think of a Cradle album I haven't enjoyed. So take what I say with a pinch of salt. <laughs> but yeah, as I as I've only heard, uh, let me think, just check a second which ones I've heard. Uh, Nymphetamine, Midian, Cruelty and the Beast. I think that's it. So, mm. I'm. Uh, the sound was just pretty enjoyable, I thought. So, as someone who's not a hugely biased fan, like Mr. Edmund Scriven, uh, yeah, I'd say this is pretty solid. Yeah. If you've heard Chris Kittleforth at any point and liked it, then I didn't see why you wouldn't like this. It's definitely got their starlings, but it's not so much of their starlings that it sounds unoriginal. So. Yeah. Anyway, next. 